Now, I have the great honor to introduce a young man that I met a couple years ago at Al Pena. I found out that he's the real deal, okay? It's so hard to find people that really, really care and that stick to the, the long game, okay? Because that's what we're really looking for is the long game. I've, I've watched him kick open doors to make sure we get access to capital. I've watched him give money, walk in the people's jobs and give them a check for their small business, unannounced, okay? I could go on and on and on, but he would probably kill me, okay? Because he, he's just such a good person. How many of you have ever met the chairman of the board of a bank, okay? And you know, Al wanted him to come and speak. And so I called him and he said, absolutely. You know, he said, I'll be there. And he, when Al passed, he said, I'm still coming, okay? And so I could go on and tell you all the wonderful things that he's done. And I call him a friend. And he's shown me over and over again what a good man he is. There's not a person in Detroit that doesn't have a good word to say about him, okay? I mean, people at all levels know him. And that's the, the unique thing about him. And, you know, lately, I mean, if I call and say, you know, we had someone turned down, can you find out why he does? Okay, and that's important that we have someone that cares that much. So I'm going to quit rambling because this is his time to speak. <laughs> but Gary Torgo, please come up. Good morning, and thank you, Dina, for that very kind and warm introduction. Your work in southeastern Michigan and across the country over many, many years has been a remarkable display of kindness and dedication and perseverance to help so many to realize home ownership and the education that is required to achieve that status. Thank you, Dina, for your partnership, your wise counsel, and your very special friendship. I'm also privileged to be here today with my incredibly talented and dedicated colleagues from Huntington Bank. My good friend, Mr. Donald Dennis, who is the Chief Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Culture Officer who's sitting in the front row here. Huntington Bank's Detroit President, Latrice McClendon, sitting here at the table. And her wonderful staff and colleagues in the volunteer community and giving space, community giving marketing manager, Katarina Flato, and community development relationship manager, Courtney Elledge, both here. I am so honored to work with all of you. I really feel tremendously privileged. Jules, thank you for this incredible conference. My good friend, Pastor Bell from Detroit and his wife are here, honored to see them. I thought a lot about today's conference, and I want to start by telling you a story that uh, I heard that tells really the story of people like Dina and Jules and my good friend, dear friend, who we will miss so much, Al Pina. I was at a banking conference, and it was a big banking conference quite a few years ago, and I had the privilege to sit at lunch at the main table with the speaker of the conference. It was the former Prime Minister of Great Britain, Margaret Thatcher. She was the first woman Prime Minister of her country. And I had a chance to sit next to her. And while we were chatting over lunch, she didn't know who I was, but I knew who she was. I sort of nudged over and said, Madam Prime Minister, tell me something really great that happened to you as Prime Minister. And she said, oh, a lot of good things happened to me, but let me tell you something really bad that happened. And I said, great. She said, on my first day as prime minister of my great country, I was invited to Buckingham Palace to meet the queen in a state dinner in my honor. I was the first woman prime minister. They made a special dinner. I had never been to Buckingham Palace. She said, I was so excited. I couldn't sleep the night before. I got in my car, I got driven over to Buckingham Palace, I came into the great palace, I walked into the royal room, and there at the front of the room was the queen herself. 
And I was so mortified, I just couldn't believe it. The queen and I were wearing the same dress. <laughs> she said, honestly, Gary, I did not know what to do. I couldn't leave. I was just beyond upset with myself. I was mortified. I sat through the dinner in my honor. I got back in my car to go back to 10 Downing Street for my first night in the 10 Downing Street bed. And I sat down at my desk and I penned a letter to the queen. And I said, dear queen, I am so terribly sorry for the faux pas I made on my first day as prime minister. I realized when I came into the room that you and I were wearing the same dress. I promise in the future I will never make that mistake again. Please forgive me. She said a couple days later, she got a response from the Queen's secretary. And the letter said, Dear Madam Prime Minister, the Queen received your apology letter, but you have nothing to apologize for because the Queen never notices what the commoners are wearing. <laughs> And honestly, after I met Al and Dina and Jules and the wonderful people that put this conference together but work and worked every day for this cause, it comes to mind that we all have to remember in God's world there are no commoners. Every single person is royalty. Speaking here today at this critical summit provides us with the opportunity to engage and discuss and help rectify the monumental issues we face of equality and diversity and racial equity, all in the company of so many who wish to collaborate and find solutions to this age-old dilemma of making every person equal in the eyes of our society. For so many across our nation in communities like Florida and Georgia and Alabama and California and Michigan and New York and in Illinois and in hometowns like yours, the so-called American dream is simply far out of reach. As they said this morning, nearly 43% of Latino and 47% of black households are unbanked or underbanked. Tragically, in our country with so much promise, and so many resources and so much opportunity, there are still nearly 100 million Americans on the edge of poverty or in poverty. And the trouble begins in the space and area of racial equity, where so much of the American economy operates while still severely impacting people of color who are systematically restricted from being fully realized participants. Economic equity is a crucial part of establishing, establishing holistic equity for people of color. It's not just important that black and brown citizens are able to contribute to the economy as workers and consumers, but should also have the opportunity as owners and operators with the very same access to resources and probability for success as anyone anywhere in the country. I work at a bank called Huntington, which more and more under the leadership of our CEO, Steve Steinauer, my partner, we most assuredly recognize that it is incumbent upon all of us to become champions of the effort to eradicate the harsh reality that is life for minorities in America. It has become a clarion call for our colleagues at Huntington and banks everywhere to make every effort to change the dynamic and to do everything possible to reject all forms of bias and racism and inequality in our workplace and communities. Because nobody is a commoner in our country. And we must double down on our purposeful engagement within our cities and our neighborhoods 
I honestly believe that the good Lord has allowed me the privilege to be chairman of a bank, not at all as a benefit to myself, but rather to undertake and recognize my place and responsibilities to the sacred cause of making all of the Almighty's children equal and successful and purposeful and prosperous without regard to race or creed or color or religion. I remember well my significant disappointment in my own city when discovering a few years back that in my hometown of Detroit, only 550 home mortgages were completed in a city with nearly 700,000 citizens. It began a call of action by our Mayor Mike Duggan, the leadership of our city, and all of the financial institutions across our state to do everything possible to reverse that trend. We work on it every day. We share our resources and tools to help write these realities wherever possible, and it starts in our own town. So many of these issues demand from all of us investments in community, helping to drive strategies to urgently expand access and participation for black and brown workers, consumers, and business owners, creating more pathways for entrepreneurship through building infrastructure for cooperative development, inclusive procurement, incubators, and accelerators. At Huntington Bank, our leadership created and has established a $40 billion community plan. And it is focused entirely on supporting minorities, minority women, and veteran-owned small businesses and individuals, capitalizing on and utilizing our position as the number one SBA lender in the United States. We have a big responsibility, and we have a big job. We each know the headwinds that slow us down. Increasing home and business ownership for black and brown communities is the number one barrier to increased economic security for every American in this country, no matter which neighborhood, which city, or wherever that affiliation lies. How troubling it is that African Americans make up 13% of the U.S. population, but they account for more than 52% of the low-wage jobs in this country. Latinos represent nearly one-fifth of the U.S. workforce, yet Latino-owned businesses make up only 6% of all U.S.-owned businesses in our country. How unfortunate it is that people of color can oftentimes feel intimidated when they walk into a branch or an office, and how much effort we must employ to focus on meeting customers where they are and making them feel comfortable in the environment that we have created. I do believe in my heart that most people want to do the right thing, but we must provide them with the tools, the education, and the language to adjust and give comfort to every person that walks through our doors. I know that my bank colleagues and leaders of banks all over the United States, so many of them who spoke today who are doing wonderful work, are leaning in, and they are endeavoring to find ways to right these wrongs. One of the ways that we at Huntington are doing it is through our Lift Local program, where we focus on providing patient access to capital, including free checking and treasury management services, financial education for small business owners owned by black, brown, female, and veteran companies located in low to moderate income or minority diverse census tracts. And people like Dina Harris hold our feet to the fire, and she should. This Lift Local program is showing great results, but we know we can do more and we want to. Our Lift Local business is getting more financing into the hyper-local economy and it's working every day to assist customers as they grow their personal enterprise. But we can't just create access without also providing programs that include people of color in the full finance process. We must provide the tools and the knowledge that will make our clients of color successful. Another challenge financial institutions face is regaining the trust of customers in every part of the community and working hard to be trusted business advisors. We all have a vested interest in seeing every part of society succeed. Closing the revenue gap between black and white businesses would create an additional 
$290 billion for the U.S. economy. It's no small feat, but how much of a dream that would be. I remember early on in my banking career, I sought advice from the Detroit leader of the NAACP, one of my best friends in the world, Reverend Wendell Anthony, where we talked about how our bank could be more authentic to families and business in Detroit. He said, my dear brother Gary, don't tell us what you are going to do. Show me rather what you are doing to make a difference for every citizen. And was he ever right? We took those words to heart. We were working hard in multiple areas of diversity and inclusion in our hiring practices, in our lending, in our commitment to community, in our collaboration with neighborhoods. Huntington Bank is putting tens of millions of dollars in Detroit into our partnership with two historic Detroit neighborhoods, Cody Rouge and Grandmont Rosedale. The work we are doing that I have shared with you this morning underscores important steps to doing our part like so many great banks are doing in this country. They are not our competition, they are our partners because without everybody, we are not going to succeed. That is the privilege and the responsibility of the entire American banking system. But we recognize as all of our colleagues that we have a long way to go to doing what we know is required for each of us to make America the greatest country on earth for every citizen, not just for some or in certain areas or neighborhoods. Everybody has to be included. I close this morning with thinking about the young man who is passing the ferocious tiger cage at the local zoo. He tells the zookeeper nearby that the tigers look so fierce and scary but yet the bars keeping the tigers away from us are so thin. Is it not possible, the young man asks the zookeeper, that those tigers could just rip open those bars and attack us all? The zookeeper said, yes, young man, you are right, but you don't have to worry because the tigers simply don't realize how thin those bars are and they don't appreciate their strength. We live in a time and place where these issues are fierce and oh so troubling. And yes, the bars are thin, but the solutions are within our grasp. The conundrum is that many amongst us fail to realize or appreciate our own strength or our ability individually and collectively to simply stand up and make a difference, to be a leader or to take us in a direction that we all must go. It is not glitzy corporate social responsibility campaigns. It is just and only a real effort to tear down those bars, doing one more thing each day to eradicate the barriers to access and inclusion and equity. But we must all do our part tomorrow and the next day and get up and do it again and again and again. That is the pathway to ever stronger communities, to increasing access to capital, to being racially relevant and bringing education to the doorstep of every person that wishes to participate. We will continue to try to do our share, but one bank, one organization, one team of leaders is never enough. It takes a concerted country effort of government, companies, thought leaders, working hard with determination, with sacrifice, with intentionality to turn that big ship of America around. Look at how much progress we have made, but never lose sight of the fact that this job is far from done. Let's not think about what we are going to do. Let us do the work that is required and that we know when done will help elevate every person, every company, and every family across this great country of ours. Every human being is royalty in the eyes of God, and it must be the same for us with our own people. I thank you so much for allowing me this time this morning. May this summit be the catalyst for greater and greater success for every individual without regard to their ethnicity, their orientation, or their station in life. And let us work hand in hand, not competitors, friends and brothers and compatriots, to change the way the world looks at every individual 
We must give everybody the same opportunity. Thank you and God bless you all.